Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Gracious Lord, and just on this beautiful day, um, Father, we, we just lift you up a few days after Christmas, and, and all of us had such a wonderful time on your birthday. And Lord, we just ask that uh, today's message, that you lift up those who need support, uh, that you clear our minds, Lord. We've got so many things going on that are clouding our thoughts. Just clear it for uh, the next hour or so, and, and um, let us listen to your message today, Father, and interpret it and ingest it as you would have us uh, to interpret that message, Lord. And let it be very personal. Uh, let us touch those who may be in need. Father, even though it's a holiday season, we sometimes have folks who are challenged, you know, financially, physically, spiritually. And Lord, just on this day, in this place, and in this moment, we want to put all those things aside, Lord, and hand them to you as we, as we look to receive your message on this wonderful day. Lord, we lift you up in praise. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, grab your Bibles, guys. We're going to be in the book of Ruth today. Um, we're just coming off the heels of of uh, Christmas, right? Two days ago, Christmas, the deliverance of baby Jesus, Savior of the world. Well, the theme of today is redemption. We're going we're gonna to look at how God is our great redeemer. And we're going to be in the book of Ruth to, to do that. Before we do that, we're going to, um, for those of you who are going to be bouncing around with me, we're going to actually start off in the, in the book of uh, Matthew, the beginning of the New Testament. And I'll show you there, show you that in just a minute. But what I want to tell you about first is that in um, in the Old Testament, well, in the in, for the Jewish people, they they were given a promised land, right? They were they they were the 400 years of slavery, and then they were given the opportunity to God said, "I'm going to take you, and I'm going to take you to the promised land." And in the process, uh, each family would get a, propor- a portion of the land, and it, and when they did so. Um, there was some provisions in the law that encouraged the family name and the land to continue going. And there was something called the kinsman redeemer. And what that was is that that was a, a blood relative that had the means and the willingness to buy back the land, to save the family, to get back that inheritance that was, that, that was lost. For example, if, uh, if uh, a man died um, his, and, and left, his, left his wife a widow, then, then the brother or a close relative would then, would then would take her to be able to promote the family name and to buy back the, the land that would be lost because the land was in the, in, the, in the guy's name, right? So that's, that's the story that we're going to look at today uh, is, is how God is going to rede- how God was, was uh, redeemed, um, uh, uh, redeemed a, a lady who was lost. And many of us have had a period in our life where we've been lost too. I got my buddy Marius here. You want to teach with me this morning? What a good kid. All right, he's in training. We are, uh, bef- you guys mind if I start with a love story? Is that anybody, any, are we okay with that? Um, it has to do with redemption, I promise. Uh, and speaking of love story, I'm privileged to have my friends, uh, Lori and Tanya, here celebrating their 18th wedding anniversary today. (laughs) Congratulations, husband and wife, for that long. Well, the love story I'm going to tell you about is is about my wife, Beth. Now, when I I met Beth, um, I was was in my junior year in vet school. And I actually got to know her because uh, my friend was interested in dating her. And we didn't know if she had a boyfriend or not. So she comes into the computer lab. I still remember, and we started. T- we struck up a conversation, and I remember uh, fi- figuring out that she grew up on the Big Island, and I had actually not too long before been been and stayed in Kalapa State Park, which is just minutes from where she grew up. So, time that was in the fall. So, come springtime, I'm in I'm in uh, small animal rotation clinics, and um, it's Saturday night, and I'm itching to do something fun, and I can't find anybody to go dancing with me. I was like, I'll just grab a buddy. I'll grab another one of my one of the doctors that I was working with, or I'll grab my buddy Steve. Now Steve was actually the guy who I was trying to get uh, get. He he was the one that was interested in dating Beth, and so he was he was actually the guy that I thought he was usually the one that would drag me out to go do something fun, and and he was a he was a party pooper that night. So I ended up going going out 
And I get there, and they're not letting anybody in. They're like, we're maxed out. Sorry, nobody's coming in. Except one of my friends was there for a birthday party, is standing at the front door. He goes, oh, no, he's with us. Now, he assumed that I was there for the birthday party, but I wasn't. But the Lord pulled me in anyway and said, no, wait, I got I to gotta set up for you. So while we're there, I see this girl who had, who had become my wife. And we hit the dance floor. We started getting to know each other more. And uh, that was the start of something big. And I have to tell you, when I, st when I started at, at the point that, at that, that point in my life, I had just, anybody ever been in a bad relationship before? Or was it just me? Yeah, I see a lot of hands going up. Yeah, we've all had bad relationships. Even if it's not a romantic relationship, just friendships or family things that can go bad. But, um, you know, I had, I had backslidden. I knew the Lord, but I had put him in a box and I said, I'm going to do my own thing and then I'm going to let you back in when, uh, when, when I feel like it. Well, the, I had started to say, you know what, I'm putting you first, Lord. And, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's literally a month before I'm moving campuses, seven and a half hour drive away. I'm moving to, going to another campus and I've got my eyes fixed on the Lord and he says, look what I got for you. And it's amazing because I, I look back and I think there's so many things, just that night that could have gone wrong. And then, then I was a little bit like, oh, what about my friend Steve? Is he going to be offended? You know, if he's like stepping in. They hadn't actually even dated, but, you know, just didn't want to, wanted to be polite and kind and all that. And, and he's like, no, it's okay. You can go ahead and date her. And uh, so all this stuff just kind of unfolded. And um, Deb, who's here in the audience today, was her roommate when we were dating. And so here we are, you know, now... I should tell you, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. I'm also an anticipator. So I knew that the woman that I would eventually marry, I was going to be standing before God. I was going to say, I've got to, I'm promising to be with you until death do us part. And that was some, I, I was keenly aware that I did not want to screw that up. You know, I take, I take, you know, I, I didn't want my, my uh, commitment to God to be half-hearted. And I did not want to make a mistake. So I was very careful. I wanted to find somebody who was, who was smart, who was beautiful, who had a kind heart, um, who loved the Lord. And I found all those things wrapped up into a woman I wasn't even looking for. God just said, here, you, you, were, you were distracted, but now that you put me first, now I've got something special for you. And I don't know, you know, this may be be, be encouraging for one of you now that maybe you're having a, you're trying to find that right person, but, you're, but your eyes aren't fixed on Jesus. If you don't have your eyes fixed on Jesus, you, you, you're going to miss the gifts that he has for you. And, and sometimes he's saying, wait, be patient, be patient. What you're looking for right now, you're not ready for. The person you're looking at is not the right person. But then maybe he's got this person set aside just for you. Now, you guys ever seen a couple that you're walking down and you go, misfit, uh, not exactly, like, like, he's way too cute for her. Or she's way too smart for him. It's like, I got to tell you that the Beth was, was, a, was an upgrade for me. Like, I don't, she kind of got the short end of the stick is what I'm trying to say. But that's okay. You know what? God, God uh, in his loving mercy, provided for, for me to have this girl. Now, uh, now I, I did not want to make a mistake. I did not want to, I didn't want to get divorced. And I, all this, so I, I took it slow and steady. And I knew, like, this is the girl that has it all. And finally, I found a woman that I could do just like, we, you know, with the Lord, we're supposed to love him with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. And that's what Beth was for me. Like, here's this woman that I can, you know, I've been looking for that, that has all those things that I need. Perfect for me. Remember Adam and Eve? Remember Adam in the garden and, and, and he, he met Eve to be a helper? Well, I got to confess, I needed help. And Beth was a perfect help for me. And so... We actually had a pretty long dating relationship. And, it, and like I said, a month after we started dating, I'm seven and a half hours away. I'm at Oregon State campus. Uh, I was very blessed, though. I had two classmates that moved, kind of moved with me that still had, still, still had significant others in Pullman, Washington. So when I went back, we were in the middle of what we called Killer Quarter. Killer Quarter was 26 credits. Anybody that's ever taken college, I mean, 15 to 18 credits is a full load. This is 26 credits. But it's funny how love can kind of take over, right? So here it is, Friday afternoon. It's like 4 or 4.30 in the afternoon, and we're, my classmates were looking over each other going, we could be pul in Pullman by 1 a.m. if we head out right after class. So we pack up the car, and we drive for seven and a half hours and get there in the middle of the night just to spend a day and a half 
in Pullman with our, with our loved ones. And um, I tell you this story because, so we ended up dating for about, we were, we were engaged and finally got married about three and a half years later in Hawaii. Um, and, you know, we could have had a small wedding, except uh, where I'm from, uh, you know, in Oregon, there aren't that many people that come to my wedding. But when you marry a local girl, it's kind of a different thing. So as we talked about a small wedding, it quickly became, um, well, how about 300 at the, at, the, at the wedding? And how about 500 at the, at the luau afterwards? Quite a bit bigger and, and grander. But, uh, but I'll tell you, um, I, was, I, I see couples sometimes, and they get all the photos taken before they get married. I waited because I was, I was holding out for this one special moment. And, and, and I got to see her when her, uh, and let me tell you, one of the things I love about Beth is she is, she is ravishingly beautiful. Now, she can be casual, which is kind of cool. Like, she doesn't have to be all made up all the time. But man, when she decks herself out, oh my gosh. I mean, I had tears in my eyes as I watched her come down the aisle. And Deb was there. She can just testify to it. I mean, she was incredible. And I tell you this because I waited for this one special person. And she, here she is. And now we get to... now. The, we, we had a long engagement because when we got married, I wanted to be together. I didn't want to have this long distance thing. And we had school and, and internships and stuff to still fill. So it took some time. But we come to Hawaii. And now this wouldn't be really the most ideal situation. But we actually spent like the first seven or eight months or so living with in-laws. And then we took over a business, new business in Kona. Um, we moved to a new, we had a new, a new place to live. We started construction on one place as we were working in the old spot. We were on call 24-7, and we worked together. Did I mention that? Anybody ever work with a spouse or girlfriend or boyfriend? It's, it's, I don't recommend it for everybody. Now, Beth and I actually have a really good relationship, and we can do that. And it's, you know, I, I know it's a privilege to be able to do that and not kill each other. And, uh, and most of the time, we didn't kill each other. Um, but, um, you know... When there's, um, anybody, anybody got a green thumb here? Anybody a gardener? Phaedra, I know you are. Black. Yeah. I got more of a black thumb, I know. You know, here in Kona, as long as you have, I mean, it doesn't take that much to grow things. We've got sun all the time. We've, as long as you make sure they've got the right amount of water, things grow great. And, and um, but then things can happen, right? And this, I'm notorious for this. It's like, I get it all going, and then kind of forget about it for a while and then like the weeds kind of come in and here in Kona they're like it's like in two weeks it's like poof and your you, you know the plants are covered and smothered well that's kind of you know we we endured that first year wonderfully and one of the things that I knew just back to that plant analogy I knew I had a good plant now if you have a bad plant to start with what's going to happen are you going to have good fruit you're going to have a good garden not if you don't have a good plant. And what I knew is I had a good plant. Beth was, an, was awesome. I mean, she was st strong and she was, we were perfect for each other. But as time went on, the weeds of life started to choke out our marriage. And, you know, it, it took a while. You know, we're both, we're both strong people. We're, we're, we're kind of, I mean, I'm a long distance runner at heart. So it's like I can, I can endure a lot of things. But what I wasn't realizing is that our marriage was, was that plant, that it was strong, it was super strong, it was ready to survive, but it was, it was ignored. It was choking out, and, it, and the plant was dying. And about 12 years into our marriage, uh, it got to the breaking point. And uh, I, I, remember, I, remember, um, I remember getting to that point where, and, the, and I'll tell you too, the Lord had already told me that despite this, this, tr this rough patch that we were going through, he already told me that he was going to save my marriage. And for a while, I believed him. But then, as I continued to see the withered plant, I couldn't see any signs of life in it. And I gave up on it. And uh, to my shame, that vow that I made before God and to Beth that I we, we would be together forever, I was ready to uh, abort ship. I had an escape plan with a friend on the mainland, and I was, I was on my way over to see Iz to say, I'm out of here. And uh, I had two important friends. And one, when you go through trials in life, 
there are a couple of times that you need to have some strong Christian friends to encourage you because I had some worldly friends and they meant well, they loved me, but they didn't give me good advice. They, they said, run away, don't stay. And I had a, I had a friend named Scotty that, that himself, ironically, was going through his second divorce, neither of which were his, his, his personal choice. And he said, God hates divorce. And I, no matter what, I couldn't get that ringing out of my head. And, uh, and then I headed over to Izzy's house to convince him that I, that, that, that I was making the right decision to run from the marriage. And I was ready to turn and burn. And it was a setup. God had it all figured out. And, you know, I love that. Do you guys know the, the poem Footprints? And it talks about how, you know, you're walking through life and there's, there's footprints. There's Jesus' footprints and then there's our footprints. And then, and then he, this guy goes through this huge trial and there's, there's only one set of footprints. And he's like, Lord, why did you abandon me at that time? Why did you, I needed you most there. And, and his response is, that's when I carried you. And I got to tell you, but for the Lord, the marriage was gone. The plant was dead. But he said, wait, 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 wait. There's life still here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to carry you because you can't carry yourself. And that's our Lord. That is our God who is our Redeemer. And praise be to him because he gets the glory. It wasn't me. It wasn't my effort. In fact, I didn't see the weeds coming. They, they caught me off guard. You know, that's the way that the, the devil can work, right? He like, he like creeps in and he suffocates you before you even realize what's happened. And, uh, and, but he, he is our redeemer. He is our, you know, we just celebrate he's our savior, but he's our redeemer and he brings back, we, we have an inheritance that, that, that the devil is trying to steal from us. That, that eternal life that we were to have forever, that was destined for us and yet we we've so quickly gave it away. Well, I want, to I want you to turn to Matthew, the first, uh, first uh, Matthew 1. This is the beginning of the New Testament. This, this is the start of the New Testament. It's, it's written by Matthew, one of the 12 disciples, right? And he is, um, he, one of his main themes is fulfilled prophecy. He's like, I walk with the Lord. I, I see how all of these things happened so that the, that all of the prophecy would be fulfilled. And that's something that, by the way, can really build your faith. When you, when you realize that God already has told, has said what's going to happen before it happens, that's more to put your faith on. I mean, it's still there is a moment of faith. You, have to, you still have to trust him and believe him, but he, it's not an empty faith. It's one that's full. And we, we have a lot that we, that we can, he makes promises. And he made the promise to me in my marriage that he was going to come through. Now I have a question. Was it up to me? I, I blew it. It wasn't up to me. He was faithful in his promise even though I wasn't faithful to him and I wasn't faithful to my marriage, but he said, you know what? I'm not, I'm not giving up on you and it will survive. And it's funny, I look back and I go, you told me that, but, and I, I did believe it. And you know, Abraham, the father of the Jewish faith, he was kind of like that. I mean, the Lord at 75 years old says, I'm gonna, and he has no kids. He's 75 years old and he says, I'm going to make you a nation of many people. You're going to have more offspring than sands on the shore, stars in the sky. And it says the Lord, that, that uh, Abraham believed him and he credited to him as righteousness. Now, the promise actually didn't get fulfilled until he was 100 years old. 25 years, the Lord said, it's not a big enough miracle yet. We're going to wait until, the, until it's, it's really good. So... Um, but that's but but the Lord made that promise. And by the way, he he didn't just say you're going to have Jewish people. You know, your 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 people are just going to be the Jewish people. He said, your offspring, are, you're going to bless all the people of the earth. Guess what? As I look around, I think a lot of you are Gentiles. But even though the Jews are God's chosen people, His plan is to include us as Gentiles as well. We get included in that plan. Praise the Lord for that. Now, along those, the lines of prophecy, there was also the promise of, of David, that, the, that the, um, the Christ would be in the line of King David. And we're going to see a really cool thing today because, remember we talked about that kinsman redeemer? 
In just a minute, we're going to go to, we're going to, go to um, the book of Ruth, and we're going to read the book of Ruth together, and I'm going to show you some things. And, and God is awesome. The way that he's given us the, the word, it is full of, there's stuff on the surface, and there's stuff that's so much deeper and richer. Now, I want to point out, um, this, is, this is basically just the first chapter of, of uh, Matthew, and it talks about the genealogy from Abraham right on down to to uh, to uh, uh, Joseph, who was the legal parent, the legal dad of Jesus. And um, I want to show you, there's actually five women mentioned um, in this genealogy. And I just real quickly want to point out a couple things, because first of all, three of the five, at least three of the five women are Gentiles. They're not even Jews. And this, again, this goes back to God's inclusion of, of all people. All people are going to be represented in his plan of salvation. Um, Tamar. Do you guys remember who Tamar is? You can read about her in Genesis chapter 38. Tamar was, was actually, she was kind of involved in the kinsman redeemer. Her, Judah had come down, out, left the promised land, um, married, married a foreigner, and, and had kids. And his son married Tamar. Now, he died left leaving her without without an heir. So the brother stepped in, but he was he was not faithful and true and, and God took him out. And then the third son, uh, Judah said, nope, not given her, not given him up to you. And he kind of pretended he was, but he didn't. So his wife dies. Now Tamar disguises herself as a prostitute and goes and he sleeps Judah, her father in law, sleeps with her and she has a son a son that's included in this genealogy. A little bit of color in this genealogy, don't you think? Uh, but we're not done yet. Uh, then we've got Ruth, who we'll see today. She's a foreigner, a non-Jew. We've got um, Bathsheba. She's not referred to here. She said it's Uriah the Hittite's wife. But that was Bathsheba. Remember David and Bathsheba? That, ain't that strike a bell? That's adultery. So we've got sleeping with your father-in-law. We've got adultery. Um, we've got Mary the Virgin, um, and oh, Rahab, Rahab the prostitute. Anybody jealous of this genealogy? Want this in your, you know? Now, Rahab is actually the mother of one of the main characters in the story today, Boaz. And it's interesting because she's actually mentioned in the Hall of Faith in, in, in the book of Hebrews, because of her faithfulness. And this was all when, the, when the, um, the, the Jews were coming into the promised land and they, were, they, were, and, and they sent out spies and she, in her faithfulness to God, hid the spies and he said, for that, I'm going to let you live. But she didn't, just get, she didn't just live, she got put into the genealogy, the genealogy of our Savior, Savior of the world. So you can see Jesus isn't in too particular about who he pulls in. He wants to save everybody. Now let's go to um, let's go to Ruth. Now Ruth is a small book; uh, won't take too long to read. It'll take a little bit, but um, Ruth the 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 life of of Ruth takes place in the time of the judges. This is um, this is before this is kind of the arrival in the promised land from that time until when uh, when when the monarchy would start when when you know uh, the kings would start and. Um, And that's like uh, like 1380 to 1050 BC, give or take. Um, so um, I want you to watch. There's there's two main women characters in this. And I want you to watch them. One is Ruth. She is a Moab, she's a Moabitess. That means she's from the land of Moab. And Moab was was a land east of Israel, uh, east of the on the other side of the, of the Dead Sea. So foreign people. Um, and I want you to watch her faithfulness as the story unfolds. I want you to pay attention to that. F for Boaz, I want you to watch. He, he's, like a, he's like a landowner, middle, you know, middle class kind of business owner, um, a, a Jew. And he is, watch his generosity. He, just see how he goes above and beyond um, what's, what's, what's demanded and, he, and, and how kind and generous he is. And then I want you to watch Naomi, who is 
in the process, she starts with everything, she's going to lose everything, and then watch what God does. And I want you to watch, watch her attitude through it all. I want you to see what, what happens here. Let's go ahead and, and get started now. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man from Bethlehem and Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife named Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. You notice that? Where, where are we at? Bethlehem. What did we just celebrate on Christmas? The birth of the king. And where was he born? Bethlehem. So just as a reminder, let's see. The, the, uh, the bread of life was born in Bethlehem, which means the house of bread. Pretty cool. God likes to show off. All right. So... Um, they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they lived there about ten years, both Malon and Kilian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When she heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of the people by providing food for them, Naomi and her daughters-in-law prepared her to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law left, left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you as you have shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud, and she said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and they gave birth to sons, would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. At this they wept again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and to her gods. Go back with her. But, re re but Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there, will, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty God has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? And Naomi means pleasant, by the way. So she's saying, I'm not pleasant, I'm, I'm bitter. The Lord, is, the Lord has afflicted me. Um, the, the Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabitess, and her, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Also, pay attention to the, the theme, because at the start of this, we've got the house of bread. There's a famine in the land. That's what took them to Judah in the first place, or, uh, to, uh, to Moab in the first place. And now they're coming back. She's empty, but now we're just entering the harvest season, all right? Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech, a man of standing whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone who's in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, Go ahead, my daughter. So she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they called back. Boaz asked the foreman of his harvesters, Whose young woman is that? The foreman replied, she is the Moabitess who came from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. 
She went into the field and has worked steadily from morning until now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the girls. I have told the men not to touch you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this She bowed down with her face to the ground. She exclaimed, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I have been told about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and your mother in your homeland and came to live with a people you do not know. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have given me comfort and have spoken kindly to your servant, though I don't have the standing of one of your servant girls. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come over here. Have some bread and and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and she had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to the men. Even if she gathers among the sheaves, don't embarrass her. Rather, pull out some of the stalks from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up. And don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she'd gathered and it amounted to an ephah, or about 22 liters, quite a large amount. She carried it back to her town, to town and her mother-in-law saw how much she gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Her mother-in-law asked her, Where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one whose place she had been working. The name of the man I was working with today is Boaz, she said. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and to the dead. She added, That man is our close re- close relative. He is one of our kinsmen redeemers. Then Ruth the Moabitess said, He even said to me, Stay with my workers until, the, until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It will be good for you, my daughter, to go with his girls, because in someone else's field you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to his serv- servant girls to glean until the, the barley and wheat harvests were finished and she lived with her mother-in-law. One day, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should, you not, should I not try to find a home for you, will you where you will be well provided for? Is not Boaz, with whose servant girls you have been, a kinsman of ours? Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor. But don't let him know you were there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying, then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man, and he turned and discovered a woman was lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a kinsman redeemer. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger man, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all that you ask. All my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true I am near of kin, there is a kinsman redeemer nearer than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to redeem, good, let him redeem. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could could be recognized. And he said, don't let it be known that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring me the shawl you're wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and put it on her. Then he went back to town. When Ruth came 
to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, How did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, He gave me six measures of barley, saying, Don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. I think you have to hand it to him. He's pretty smart, right? Be nice to the, be nice to the, uh, the, the in-law. Well, then Naomi said, Wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for this man will not rest until the matter is settled today. Meanwhile, Boaz went up to the town gate and sat there. When the kinsman redeemer he had mentioned came along, Boaz said, Come over here, my friend, and sit down. So he went over and sat down. Boaz took ten of the elders of the town and said, Sit here, and they did so. Then he said to the kinsman redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from Moab, is selling the piece of land that belonged to our brother Elimelech. I thought I should bring the matter to your attention and suggest that you buy it in the presence of thee seated here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you, re if you will redeem it, do so. But if you will not, tell me, so I will know. For no one has the right to it except you, and I am next in line. I will redeem it, he said. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the land from Naomi and from Ruth the Moabitess, you acquire the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead and with its property. At this, the kinsman redeemer said, Then I cannot redeem it, because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself. I cannot do it. Now, in earlier times in Israel, for the redemption and transfer of property become final, one party took off his sandal and gave it to the other. This was the method of legalizing transactions in Israel. So the kinsman redeemer said to Boaz, Buy it yourself, and he removed his sandal. Then Boaz announced to the elders and all the people, Today you are witnesses that I have bought back from Naomi all the property of Elimelech, Kilian, and Malon. I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, Malon's widow, as my wife, in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property, so that his name will not disappear from among the family or from the town records. Today you are witnesses. Then the elders and all those at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. Then he went to her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. The woman said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord, who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May it be famous throughout Israel. He, he will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child, laid him on her, in her lap, and cared for him. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. And he was the father of Jesse, the father of David. This then is the family line of Perez. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminadab, Aminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, Boaz the father of Obed, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David. Now when you look at that last lineage, that is a telescope image of what's in Matthew. We just focused in and honed in on it, but that's the genealogy. So here's Boaz getting drawn in, and here's two women, right? Naomi, who's a Jew, when her, when, her, when her husband and her sons die, she's destitute. She's got nothing, no inheritance. Her land is gone. The same token, her daughter-in-law, Ruth, a Gentile, a foreigner, she's destitute. She doesn't have a husband. God brings them into the land, and what does he do? He restores their inheritance. The inheritance that they lost they now have. Now, Boaz, God uses Boaz to be the kinsman redeemer. They bring, he brings back to them, he, he, he uses uh, Boaz to be the redeemer that gives and restores the land. And do you remember how, do you notice how much, how generous he was? Every opportunity, he was like, oh no, here's some more. Come, come here, have something to drink. Here, have some, have some extra food. I want to make sure that you're well cared, cared for because they saw how faithful he was. Now, Boaz, I see as a shadow 
of Jesus. And just as God used Boaz to deliver the Gentile and the Jew, God used his own son to be our kinsman redeemer, to take us. You know, there was the promised land, right? He delivered his people into, into, into the promised land. But there's a spiritual land, a land of it's heaven, that, that we lost our inheritance. The devil took it away. You guys remember in the Garden of Eden, God, God made this, this awesome, it was heaven on earth. And you've got, he's got, you've got Adam, and he gives the perfect helper, Eve. There's no thorns. There's no weeds. Anybody jealous of that? I am. I could grow something there. He says, and God's so uptight, he's like, be, be, uh, be fruitful and multiply. Enjoy it. There's just one thing I, I'm telling you not to do. One sin. What was that? Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's like, it's full of plants. It's full of things. It's, 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 a, it's a beautiful place. It's, you don't even have to do much work. There's no weeds. What's there to do? Harvest. Take it off the tree and eat it. But what did they do? Eve, Eve, uh, Eve, Eve uh, the devil tempted, tempted her, right? And he said, eat of it. Now God said, don't eat of it. Don't eat of the tree of knowledge, for when you do, you will surely die. And what does Satan say? Ah, eh, you're not going to die. He's just jealous. He doesn't want you to, ha- to, to be all-knowing. And so he tempted her, and she said, oh, I'll eat of it. And then Adam does too, right? Now, when God confronts them about the sin that he said, what did he say? Don't do it, and you will die if you do it. Eve says, oh, it was the serpent that did it. Didn't you make the serpent? And throws him under the bus. Totally, totally understand that. And then what about when, when Adam, he's like, you gave me this woman. She's the one that, that tricked me. Throws, throws uh, Eve under the bus. Not too cool. But the reality is that um, God knew that he was going to have to provide from the very beginning. He knew. Did you know that one of the, one of the trees in the garden was a tree of life? And that once Adam and Eve sinned against God, he cut them off from it. He kicked them out of the, out of the Garden of Eden. That was, that was heaven on earth. He said, you guys, you, you now, are, you now have, have knowledge of good and evil, and now you're stuck. Now you, you had everlasting life. You lost it. But God's going to come, and he's going to redeem it. He's going to restore that inheritance that was lost. And before you go hard on Adam and Eve, and I've done that before, I'm like, oh, why did you guys have to screw up? We had it easy. We had it good. Who here is without sin? Yeah, I mean, none of us, the Bible says we're all, we've all sinned and fallen short. So before you throw Adam and Eve under the bus, realize that we're all sinners. We've all lost our inheritance. We've all lost eternal life. But then there's Jesus. Jesus came to redeem that what was lost. And when he was on earth, he had a mission, right? He had to go to the cross to pay for our sins, um, to, so that we could be righteous before a, a righteous and holy God. But remember, Jesus was generous on earth, just like Boaz going above and beyond. He didn't just bring everlasting life. He healed the sick. He, was, he would talk to people that, that society said you shouldn't be talking to. You're a Jew. You shouldn't be associating with the, with the Roman, with the, with the woman, with the foreigner. With the, was there anybody that Jesus didn't go to? Is there anybody that he would that was that was beyond his reach? Not anybody. We're all included in his in his uh, his plan of salvation. I'm going to just flip real quickly. If you want to read that that um, uh, uh, story of Adam and Eve, it's in chapter two and three. But I want to read one thing for you right now, and then we're going to head to the end of the Bible, last book of the Bible, Revelation. This is um, Genesis three twenty one. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. He drove the man out. He placed him in the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Now, flip with me to Revelation. Last, last book, last chapter of the Bible. Now, this is written by John. The Apostle John, the one that was one of God's 
you know, Jesus is inner three in the circles that would go on the little, sub, little sub side shows with him. He wrote this. This is, this is, he's talking about a vision that he was given. And this is heaven, guys. Chapter 22, verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Down the middle of the street of the city, on each side of the river, stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves on the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and the servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. You see what, see what God did there? He just restored the inheritance that was lost here in the garden. He brought it back. Thanks be to God, who is our Redeemer. Now, it's my privilege today, we're going to, as we close here, we're not going to do a closing song because we've got a baptism to go to. And I'm excited because um, I've been watching this, this uh, late young lady uh, grow in the Lord, and today she declares, she gets baptized. And if you want to know more about it, read Romans 6, and it talks about being buried. We, we get buried in the waters of baptism. We die with Christ. It kills we, we, we crucify the old self, the old sinful nature, and instead we're alive. When we come out of that water, we're alive in Christ. We're no longer under this curse, this curse of sin. We have grace. We walk with grace in the Lord, and he gives us power to overcome, and he's given us eternal life. Um, we lost that inheritance, each one of us, but God, our Redeemer, has restored it. All right, Lord, let's, 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 uh, let's pray right now. Lord, I thank you that you are a redeemer. I thank you for the story of Ruth, how you used Boaz to redeem both Naomi and Ruth and restore their inheritance. And Lord, we're even more thankful that you would send your son to redeem us, to give us everlasting life that we can eat again of the tree of life. Lord, for any broken relationships that we're facing right now, we just pray that because we can trust you for eternal life, Lord, we can trust you for even the small things. So encourage us, help us walk with you. Let us be encouraged by the great Redeemer you are. We ask this now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.